time. I was going to actually take the credit. I was going to say I forced you to do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Here we go. And we're live. Testing, testing. Today on Quality Time with Family Ties, we learn. I forget. Three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Quality Time with Family Ties. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Pepper. I am here coast to coast with Paul Packler. How are you, Paul? I'm great. I'm feeling kind of guilty about that joke. I, mean, I know. You feel guilty about it. I forced you to do it. I thought it was um, it was all right. It was all so right. It was, it was all right. I think it's what a gentle. Else, you know, we won't I'll open it up to the to the audience. What yeah. would you have put for the <laughs> for the intro here? The the only thing I was thinking, my the only other thing I, I thought of afterwards was uh, the I um, mean this in this week's episode we learned Gary David Goldberg should never write another episode. <laughs> that was all I had to say. Was this him? This was him. He was guilty of this one. This must have been a personal story to him. You can't have the reek of personal story. Um, and boy, it just reeked. I, it was, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it, this episode is, what is this? Episode eight, season six, episode eight? No, season six, episode nine, 69. Uh, nice. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, amazing. I'm doing all the low hanging fruit today. I'm going, I'm going. So you've made an Alzheimer's joke and a <laughs> sexual position joke. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, I'm, I'm loading up on beans. I'm going to fart in a little bit. <laughs> um, I'll tell you. It is the, entitled The Way We Were, and as I said to you earlier, um, this, this, this show invoked the same feelings inside of me that The Way We Were, the movie The Way We Were did. It, I felt it was sort of ooey, gooey, treacly, and you know, I don't have a real problem with handling a serious subject on a half hour show. I just have a problem with handling it in the manner they handled it in, which to me was really heavy handed. The final scene was ridiculously heavy handed. And no. I will get done better. This is a very special episode, like capital V, capital S. And 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 I wasn't even crazy about Meredith Baxter Burney's performance. I got to be honest. I thought she just sort of was sort of ham handed with it. I thought she sort of played everything in her face. I thought she did everything to take sad material and make it sadder. And then I've got a genuine problem that I'll bring up as we parse the episode. Who's the actress that plays um, her aunt? Because she, I thought, was the best part of this whole episode. She is a wonderful actress by the name of Barbara Barry, who yours truly worked with the summer of 1972. So prior to this, Barbara wow. Barry was a New York actress, um, stage actress, married to a composer by the name of Jay Harnick, who is the brother of the incredibly famous Sheldon Harnick of Harnick and Bach, the writers of Fiddler on the Roof, She Loves Me, um, um, what else did Harnick, the Rothschilds, uh, what, oh, what was the other Harnick and Bach, Fiorello. Um, oh, wow. Just hit musicals after hit musical of the late 50s through early, mid, uh, mid 60s, almost to the late 60s. Right. And Jay was Sheldon's brother, and he founded a musical theater organization in New York called Theater Works, which is a, a, a company that encourages young musical theater writers. So the whole. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've had friends act there. I've had friends write there, and yeah. Jay, and Jay passed away a few years ago. Barbara was married to him his entire life. She's most famous for uh, a movie she did in the early 60s. I'm forgetting the name of it, but she won the Best Actress Award at the Cannes Film Festival. Mm. What was she it was, about? Well, I, I just What forget. was the film about? Okay. I've, 
And and what I do remember was she was nominated for an Oscar once too for Best Supporting Actress for the wonderful movie Breaking Away. She was uh, Dennis Christopher's mother in that movie. Oh, wow. Bicycle riding movie. And she was perhaps most famous stage-wise as the creator in the original cast of Sondheim's Company. She was nominated for a Tony Award for Best Supporting Actress for playing the role of Jenny in Company, which is a terrific part. It is an ensemble show, but she was terrific won the Tony Award, or was nominated for a Tony Award. And when I worked with her in 1972, I worked in a musical theater in Summerstock, which was about an hour and a half north of New York. And she came up and played Jenny in our production of Company, so that we was, she was the big star of our production of Company. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so she was just terrific, a really nice lady, and then went on to like do a whole bunch of episodes as Barney Miller's wife. She was a recurring the entire run of the show as Barney Miller's wife. What, on, 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 oh, that's Barney I, Miller. That's amazing. Yeah, she was uh, Barney Miller's wife. Uh, wonderful, you know, just a terrific New Yorky type. Yeah, I, there's a there's a photo of me that looms large in the. Packler legend where I'm on my tricycle inches away from the television watching Barney Miller and that's how I would watch all TV which probably accounts for your eyesight now exactly yeah I'm, I'm <laughs> legally blind now but that Barney Miller episode was great <laughs> so wait, we trashed the blind <laughs> we, we hit Alzheimer's <laughs> <laughs> a little anorexia or bulimia joke later on. There's money well, in there. We still got time. We're still in the first act. <laughs> well, let's get started with the sound of uh, We're in the living room. Oh, by the way, I, I wrote down at the top of my page. This played more like an after-school special than anything else to me. This is, you know what, and it's, it reminds me of other really bad, very special episodes of, like, different strokes where they would be, you know, kidnapped by a child molester or something, and then they would have the most gear-shifting <laughs> from, like, the most uncomfortable jokes where everyone's making really weird, almost like what we're doing right now. Well, but you're right, because the tone becomes weird. That's what I'm objecting to in Meredith. With Baxter Burns' performance in the last act. My, my, my objection is to the tone of it. It became uncomfortable that we were making jokes moments ago. Yeah, and the jokes are just so outlandish compared to when it gets serious. And the and, serious stuff in this episode, I thought was pretty good. And, and you're, you are right. Barbara Barry is a wonderful actress. She's wonderful in this. She, she makes she makes the whole episode. It's the best acting in all the seasons we've seen so far. Absolutely. Um, so we start in the living room. Uh, we have uh, sleeping parents as uh, Andrew and Alex walk in. We have uh, everybody sprawled out together on the couch, Elise and Steven. Um, and Alex... Uh, decides to dig right on in, like three steps into the house, with Alex P. Keaton patented misogyny. He is, you know what? And I just minutes before I started watching it, a friend of mine posted on Facebook this this article from Slate, uh, where it's it's titled "Kids Learn Sexism Very Early." Here's how parents can help them unlearn it. And so I am going to post that on Facebook and Twitter, you know, for a little advertisement for the episode. Uh, it's a great article about it because Alex P. Keaton is indoctrinating Andy with, I mean, it's every episode at this point with the most obnoxious sexism and misogyny. And at the, at the least, mom was sleeping this time. Right, but, but she there, wakes up and starts arguing with him about it. Yes, but there are many episodes in which it's done right in front of her and she doesn't correct him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but this article is really good. I highly recommend everyone listening check it out. So Alex picks up a Barbie doll and he starts to teach Andrew some horrific lesson. And by the way, this is the first of two Andy Keaton compliments. He was terrific in this first scene. Yeah, he very much was. He was the best part of this yeah. episode. When everyone else is arguing like like crazy people about this, you know, playing with the doll and stuff, uh, like mom's being crazy. Steven wakes up and is very dumb and weird. He's like a, a caricature. And, and Andy mm -hmm. actually was enjoyable to watch. Um, 
So they have this little interplay about Barbie, um, and then uh, Nick and Mallory come in. Um, and they've apparently come back from the library, and we have this uh, hole in the show that you can drive a train through before Alex makes his dumb joke. Um, and uh, we, we all, that's all we can do. That's exactly all I do anymore when I just, okay, another one. Just another dumb joke. I, I got to tell you something. I, I've been wanting to say this actually for the last couple of episodes that we've done about dumb jokes. In American Housewife, they have done a couple of younger brother making fun of the older sister uh, with a dumb joke. Oh. And maybe, now, they're not doing it incessantly yet. I saw, I heard one joke in one episode. And then maybe three episodes later, I had another dumb joke. And you know what? I don't think of that character as the sister being particularly dumb. So I'm just wondering, are the writers, it's, it's, it is, it's low hanging fruit, you know, the dumb joke. Right. Now, are they, is it, is it that the younger brother is making fun of her for being dumb because it, it, does it say more about him as a character or is she actually something where they're trying to make her look dumb or what? A little bit vapid. There, I mean, there's an emptiness. She's a 16-year-old teenager, so there's a, you know, there's a, she's interested in, in her looks and her clothes and her friends and being blonde. And... Interesting. So it's very yeah, similar, similar in dynamic to Family Ties. There is a similar uh, dynamic, but she is definitely, no, but it, uh, look, I think Mallory is pretty sassy, too. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, except, of course, in, in this episode. Mallory uh, is reading, however, in this episode, Wuthering Heights, which Elise then launches into her love of Wuthering Heights. I've not read Wuthering Heights. Is it any good? I couldn't tell you. Never saw the movie, never read the book. No. And at this point, we've gathered... <laughs> Corey, the entire... Corey, hashtag check our sexism. Well, we're thinking <laughs> for the Bronte sisters? Yeah, I have read Jane Eyre. I've read Jane Eyre. Oh, there you go. Okay. Jane Eyre, and uh, loved Sense and Sensibility. The movie Sense and Sensibility with Emma Thompson winning an Oscar is a terrific movie. Very witty, mm -hmm. very charming. Is that the um, one with Colin Firth, too? Got me, I dozed. Um, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's in one so, of them. So we've gathered the entire Keaton family plus one, plus Nick, right? Everybody's together in the living room here. When at this point, a knock on the door comes, and who arrives but the wonderful actress Barbara Barry playing Aunt Rosemary. She comes in like a bat out of hell. She's got some sort of tarp on. I don't know what the outfit is. You know, it's kind of hippie-ish. It is. She's kind of hippie-ish. And she's, to describe her, would say she's incredibly spunky. She's in her, maybe her, her late 50s. She looks like she's around 60. Maybe she's In reality, I know she was in her mid-50s. But she has grayish hair, so she was playing sort of 60-ish. And very spunky, very spry, very uh, verbose um, Aunt Rosemary. She looks, uh, like how, <clears throat> she looks like how Joan Baez looks now. Yes, with that short gray hair. Yes, and yeah, but but substantially more upbeat than yeah, much more upbeat than Joan Baez would probably be. Right, that's true. Because if I was going to do my impression of Joan Baez, it would be very Mitch. She's the Mitch McConnell of folk singers. <laughs> I've never heard that put together, but that kind of works. Yeah, we have something, but I'm going to sing a sad song. Yeah. She used to sing differently. She used to do the, oh, you know. That's I love her. That was a little tiny Tim. Thanks. <laughs> um, we got and, our village. We got our village name check going on right now. <laughs> Next up, Corey's Dave Van Ronk. Here we go. <laughs> hi, Susanna. How are you? Hi, Corey. Hi, Paul. How are yeah, you? Yeah, Susanna's on. Hi, Susanna. I'm good. How are you doing? The whole family. Thank you. Slogan yes, Logan. The gang's all here. Yeah, the gang's all. Um, so at this point, Aunt Rosemary comes in, and it sort of sneaks out. Hey, Aunt Rosemary, we had no fucking idea you were going to show up like this. <laughs> and she sort of goes, "Oh well, I called Mallory and I spoke with her about it." And Mallory looks perplexed. 
And Alex sort of looks accusatorily at her like, you dumb piece of shit. You didn't tell us that Aunt Rosemary is it was coming to town? And everybody sort of looks confused. And nobody says anything. And we sort of fade out to the kitchen. Which is, yeah, that, uh, that, that all tracks. That makes sense. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that development. Um, so we're in the Did kitchen. Did she have bags? Did she have a suitcase? I don't remember. You know, that's a good question. I don't think she did. So she showed up without luggage to Ohio. I don't know where she was from. Did they ever tell us where she was from? No, but at the same time, when we find out the big reveal, um, she doesn't know how she got there. Uh, I'm sorry, really? I spoiled it. I spoiled it. <laughs> well, well, tell me about Rosebud now, Paul. <laughs> it was a sled. He regrets his childhood. <laughs> and that movie, Psycho, please, I don't want to oh eat it. No spoilers. <laughs> Janet Lee doesn't get to keep the money. Spoiler. <laughs> well, um,. What did I write? Mom pushed her. What did mom push her to do? <laughs> I write in the kitchen. To to stop being a ballerina and become a carpenter. Or no, I'm sorry, a designer. Oh, that was it. She was sort of blamed. Architect. Blamed. Now, the, the, I'm assuming Aunt Ro the connection here, and really I was paying just enough attention to write down about a page of notes. Um, <laughs> not that much attention. Um, I'm assuming, did, did we find out that Aunt Rosemary is... Um, is Elise's mother's sister? That's where. That's exactly where I was taking it. Okay. Because they seem to be on the on mom's side of the family here, on Elise's mom's side. So if it was a great aunt, that's my assumption. So we we get someone states that girls can do anything, trying to counteract the misogyny of the first scene of the first act. Right. Because once again, Alex and Andy are just you know laying yes. bare all of this crap. And Alex, Andy, and Alex states that Andy and I have a different opinion of that. Jesus Christ, Alex! What what are you trying to pull here? My God! Like, what do you care so much about what women do? Yeah, what's it to you, Alex? It's like it's like it's like the white supremacists. It's like what's it to you? Let everybody live. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in this world I find unpleasant, but I don't find the need to tell anybody about it. Um, <laughs> the most untrue thing you've ever said. That's not true at all. <laughs> okay. I do rant and, and you're right. I have, <laughs> we're literally, we're literally ranting about a sitcom. No one watches <laughs> just so that way you and I can get together like arguably once a week. To yell about it. <laughs> yeah. By the way, um, the, that was a guy who used to work with us, right? <laughs> Scott. That, oh, that's his name. Thank you. I, I knew I knew there was someone, and I don't think I've done a show with him, but once in the last three, four months. It's pretty good, though, right? It's pretty good. Pretty good deal. <laughs> just wanted to bust Here's it. the thing. Here's my secret thing that I've been doing all season, is yeah. I just keep not scheduling during the weekend when I know Scott can't do it, or when he can do it. I can do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> and that, I just, I just like, I just like the text where he apologizes for missing. That's the only reason I'm doing this. Uh, this was a good one today too. We should collect them and like do like a reading, like at like yeah. at like music stands of Scott's bailing out texts from doing podcasts. <laughs> I don't know if he listens to these, but I really hope he listens to this one. Kerry isn't feeling well today. And Henry has been pooping since 3 a.m. <laughs> Maisie is a shining light, and I adore her, but her colicky belly makes her cry all night long. No way I can do it today, boys. Sorry. See you next week. Scott. Wow. And I can't even believe that you were able to in inject that emoji at the end. You made a great face <laughs> that I knew what emoji that was. Oh, man. Um, so we're in the kitchen. And um, 
Alex, oh, oh, oh somebody's uh, telling uh, um, Elise that she can be an architect. And then there's some great stories that go on between Aunt Rosemary and, and Mom. And, and she called Stephen Phil for some reason. Yes. So they, they, we get back so many generations in the Donnelly household in this episode. If you want to do a family tree. I can't believe you paid attention to this because I paid zero attention to this. Because apparently they, they say that there was a grandmother. They say, no, no, no. So they say they're, they're talking about a great grandmother. So they yeah. say it's not just that, that um, Elise's mom, who would be Aunt Rosemary's sister, they're not talking about her. They're talking about granny. Uh, uh, so, and then that woman never could remember Stephen's name and called him Phil. So we're going back four generations in the Donnelly, whatever their names are, mm -hmm. uh, in this episode. And after the story, we find out that the story was very different to both Elise and Rosemary. It meant different things. Mm-hmm. And, and then everybody leaves, and Rosemary goes, oh, Elise. And then she retells the story about the architect and the dancing. And after Elise had already told that story just minutes before, and it feels like something might be up. Especially the way the camera lingers on Meredith Baxter Burney's overacting face. <laughs> it's too bad because she's really good most of the time. And this one, it just felt very... And it could have been her direction too. It could have been the direction she was given to play it. Um, it, it was just played, it was telegraphed what was happening. With, there were so many hints and it was just totally telegraphed. And all of a sudden, uh, we're in another scene, and uh, what's this Nora Corrigan in 1741 story that I wrote down? Now the rubber is meeting the road. This is, this was probably Gary David Goldberg up at three in the morning on Coke, being like, this is why I'm writing this fucking episode, you guys, because I'm writing this fucking monologue. And this monologue, and then the monologue at the end. Yes. And so what happens is everybody's sitting around the living room and Aunt Rosemary gets up and starts regaling them with the history of pre-Donnelly women, that all the Donnelly women were gorgeous and all the guys that they were married to were yutzes that doesn't even matter who they were. And she goes, it started in the 18th century, 1741, ye old Ireland, where blah, 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 blah. And it's the story of this woman because the English robbed the Irish of their land. So this woman had to, she was a widow, she had a child, and she was forced to marry someone. So it was like, I, I don't know, like the handmaid's tailor, whatever you, I, I don't know what the verbiage that I should be using of this woman being forced into marriage with her <laughs> oppressors. I don't know what you call that. But she goes into a bar and she says, which, which one of you is man enough to marry me right now because she wants to keep her land. And then all of a sudden she goes, oh, uh, Rose, Aunt Rosemary's like, she can't remember what the quote was, which one of you are man enough to marry me. Um, and so all of a sudden everyone's just like, what's going on? And at least has an inkling of what's going on. So she starts to try to help her with the story and, and say what she was about to say. But then Aunt Rosemary gets really pissed off and yells at, at least she's like, I've been telling this story for 40 years. Don't you interrupt me. And then everyone's like, whoa, what the fuck's going on? And then all of a sudden, she starts saying that she can't remember things. And I'll, I'll leave it to you, Corey. I feel like I've been talking too long. Oh, gosh, no, you haven't been talking too long at all. You just sort of wrapped up that first act. That's where we were at. Um, she's confused. Now, what happened? She gives a good yeah, performance, yeah. Barbara Barry. I thought she was really effective in this. Uh, especially that hostile moment was very real. And even the recovery from the hostile moment was sort of real, where she went from angry to confused. And, you know, we sort of know what exactly is going on here, that she's uh, having some early onset of Alzheimer's problems that we get confirmed later in the middle of the second act. But, you know, we can sort of see what's happening here. But it's uh, from the, the volcano of her lashing out to, like, her eyes just start going glassy. Yeah. 
uh, uh, Barbara Barry, and and it's just really affecting because you see how she's just like, I don't remember some of your names, and I'll be honest, I don't know how I got to your house. And like as she's admitting these things, it's just like the air goes out of the room in a way that good acting does. And mm -hmm. so you're sitting there watching it, like genuinely affected by this performance. Mm -hmm. And then they go to commercial, and you're like, oh my god, that's how an act-out is supposed to work. <laughs> Haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, it was really a lovely moment, and she just knocks it out of the park. And, and the sad thing to me is I think Gary David Goldberg in his fantasy thought he was ending act one like this with a, with a, with a huge ovation, and he thought he was ending act two the same way. And I just thought that Meredith Baxter Bernie's performance was in act two, just it was like, a, I wanted to wash my mouth out. It was just disgusting. Yeah, very treacly. So, all right. So with that, with that great ending of the first act, we'll take a break and we'll be right back. And we're back. So, uh. Act two. What do we start with? Are we in the doctor's office already? No, no. We start in the kitchen. We're discussing the Rosemary's behavioral problems. You know, the show is they get into old age and dementia. And oh, here, I, here were the, the the jokes that worked for me in the show happened in this scene. Um, I have two. I have three jokes that worked in this in this whole scene, and it was the only time I really thought that. Okay, they made this scene a little funnier to maybe make up for the fact that we were really getting to the to the to the meat of the episode. Um, mm. Nick makes a, has a really funny little moment with Elise. Do you remember he makes sort of an old age joke with her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He keeps saying that like you know, oh, it could just be it could just be old age, right? Isn't that how he, when when your when your brain is getting old, Mrs. Keaton? Isn't that what you find the, to be the case? And she's like, Nick, um. 45 years old. He's like, oh, yeah, well, that's really old. Like, you're on the steps of death, right? And that sort of dynamic. It was um, so much funnier when Nick did it than I did just now. <laughs> and then Alex makes another dumb joke to Mallory about slow-minded jokes, slow, slow jokes, slow mind jokes. It was a slow yeah, joke. And, and I know it's a very special episode where they're half teach. it's infotainment, but it feels like they just invented Alzheimer's in this episode. Like, no one knew what it was. It, it really does. It seems a little 1937 of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, if you watched how, like, Days of Wine and Roses... No, Lost Horizon invented alcoholism. Oh, I thought that was Days of Wine and Roses, no? Or there was it, something before Lost that? Horizon may have been a little earlier. That was Ray Milland in, like, the mid-50s, you know, going to Shangri-La. But but really, I have to say, that and Days of Wine and Roses, we'll go with Days of Wine and Roses invented alcoholism. Every right. movie since then about alcoholism owes itself to Days of Wine and Roses. Great performance by Jack Lemmon, right? Absolutely. Um, and in this, you know, it's like, okay, but Alzheimer's was not 1987, and that's where we are right now in 1987. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Rosemary is, is sorry, I wrote down, and she's on, a, on your mind. Uh, I don't know even what that means anymore. Yeah, oh. I mean, it's definitely a moment where everyone's sort of recalibrating and trying to figure out what to do next, or if they should take her home, or find... Because she, apparently, Aunt Rosemary has a daughter. She has her own family. And that's something in this episode that I felt was very lacking, is that she obviously ran away from wherever she was. Wherever she was living, she, she you know, uh, uh, traveled. She got on a bus or something and left her home. And that her family, her actual daughter, would be very worried about her, and we never see her. No, we never see her. We never make a phone call. We don't ever wrap that one up. No, and that's something that would be necessary. I feel like the daughter should come in for the doctor's appointment or to pick her up to take her home. Uh, when we get to the doctor's appointment, that was exactly my comment. My comment was, and, and then later, and, and then this whole thing takes off. This whole, why are, why is Elise seemingly becoming 
the primary caretaker at this point for her aunt who doesn't live there and has her own family. So it just started to take on the trappings of, okay, this is silly. It's, it's honestly, the, it's, the, it's the character problem that is the same thing with why does everyone still live at home when two of these kids go, are going to college? Mm -hmm. It's like ev everything on Family Ties is limited by the fact that you can only have these five characters and it can only be set in this house. We get Mallory coming into the scene, though, and I thought this was really funny. She shouted at Aunt Rosemary like she was deaf right. and then spoke slowly like she was um, um, uh, educationally handicapped. Right, right. Man, um, oh man, they <laughs> we've come a long way on TV. Sure have, haven't we? Um, uh, and then uh, Mallory does something with the phone. What does she do with the phone? Oh, that I don't even remember. This phone off. Something was funny about a phone. Anyway, Rosemary uh, confesses that she uh, she she went out one day and she couldn't find her way back home. None. We get another sad story of very effectively told by Rosemary. That was right. the moment, however, I knew my, we had to move my mom from by living alone. Was she confessed to me that one day she didn't know where she lived? Oh wow! She was in her uh, her apartment apartment complex, and she was confused. I noticed when I went to take her out a couple of times that she would turn in the wrong direction to go to the parking lot. And when we got out, out of the car, she would turn in the wrong direction to go to her apartment. And I was like, hmm. oh, wait a minute, you need someone to lead you to these places you don't remember anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and you had a personal thing with this too, with your, your, your grandfather. Yeah. 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 So like when I was a, a teenager, my grandfather, when I was like 12, he was diagnosed and then pretty, I think it was, it must've been pretty aggressive because it only lasted like four years, five years before he passed away. How old was he when he was diagnosed? I want to say somewhere in his early sixties, mid sixties. Wow. That's my age. He was born. I know it's weird, right? Yeah. He seemed so old back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. But, uh, uh yeah, I, I was, yeah, there were, there were parts of this episode that were affecting for me where I was just like, you know, you, you bury stuff deep down and, and you don't feel things anymore. And then all of a sudden you just have like a, oh, I remember how I used to feel when I was 14 or, you know, and, and there were scenes or there were parts during the conversation with Elise and uh, uh, Aunt Rosemary that were just, they felt very real where, mm -hmm. you know, like her being afraid of losing her memory. Yeah, I mean, it's very cliche, but like those sorts of conversations are very real and very true. And, you know, there's a documentary that's amazing that people should watch if you're listening. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, Corey, but the Glenn Campbell documentary that he made when mm -hmm. he was dealing with Alzheimer's, it's called I'll Be Me. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's, it's really wild. Um, and uh, a movie I have not seen. Did you see Still Alice, Julianne Moore? No, no, I didn't. Is that good? It's supposed to be wonderful. Oh, she's just a wonderful actress. I, I adore yeah. her. I think it came um, out around the same time as the documentary, and I was like, I've cried enough. I, yeah. I don't need I'm, to watch another yeah. Alzheimer's thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we, we are now in a doctor's office, and this scene basically consists very straightforward of a doctor telling uh, Aunt Rosemary and Elise, uh, her niece, um, uh, a diagnosis, a serious diagnosis of Alzheimer's. There's no cure. It's very uh, after school specially. The scene in particular is an after school special. It became expositional, almost educational for Alzheimer's as if nobody had ever heard of Alzheimer's before. Um, there's, they even throw in a unbelievably foreshadowing Reagan joke. Yeah. Oh gosh, I didn't even think of it in that way. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah who eventually succumbed to Alzheimer's. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we go from this scene, which really is straightforward, with more exposition about, um, about Alzheimer's than family ties. What do you mean? How so? 
from the doc once the doctor enters into the scene the scene becomes more about educating the audience about alzheimer's disease than it becomes about family ties yeah i agree it it, it loses all narrative steam it's not like we're following it's not like they the characters want anything we've found yeah. out everything we did need to know and then it's really just like how long do you have what can we do? Or is there treatment? All, uh, you know, I mean, I, in reality, yeah, those were, would be the questions that you would ask in a, in a doctor's office where that sort of thing comes up. But at the same time, in the show, it just feels like everything, the, the air goes out of the, the plot. And, and then we get back to the kitchen at the Keaton household. And we have Alex who, who doesn't want to let Aunt Rosemary go. I don't want to let her go. And then we have the beginning of a scene that I found downright offensive. And oh, that which part? was when Elise sorta of, kinda of breaks down in front of Aunt Rosemary and we have the victim comforting <laughs> her niece. That's very true. And there were parts of the scene, this is the scene I was talking about that I liked some of it, but they, that's a very, Good That's so cognizant of what is going on. That is not something you need to burden her with. I'm gonna be. Right. I'm gonna miss you so much. Hey, Aunt Rosemary, is there anything I can do to help you? Aren't your needs more important right now? No, Elise. Shut the fuck up. It's not about your loss. What about her daughter? What about her grandchildren if she has any? Right. Yeah, that yeah, it's a very fucked up dynamic. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's and nothing to say. It's true. Think about Elise because she's the emotional center for those of us who are watching Family Ties. But I just thought in real life that sort of makes her into a creep, a narcissist mm -hmm. creep. Oh, I'm so sorry you're dying of Alzheimer's disease. How am I going to deal with your loss? Yeah, you know what? You just saying that right now. It reminds me of back in season one when. Uh, Mallory's friend gets pregnant and we have to figure out how that makes Mallory feel as opposed to her friend. Right. Um, and from this point forward, I will read you verbatim what I've written in my notes and then we can reminisce together about the rest of the episode. I wrote down, dear sweet God, I'm going to vomit and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I will choke on it and die before the scene is over. Wow, that's that's a very new. Uh, Thanks. Very I was new hoping to choke on my own vomit to death before Elise finished this scene that almost flared up my almost healed diabetes. My diabetes. I got diabetes. <laughs> almost flared up my diabetes. Before the show started, you said diabetes, and I was like, oh, things are, we, uh, you've already devolved. That You've already <laughs> turned into Ed, Ed Brimley, or what not Ed Grimley, Ed, uh, what's his name? Wilford Brimley. I got diabetes. 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 So, uh, but this scene sort of flared it up. It was so sweet. It was what we get to. And you'll have to relate it to what she actually said because I, I just tuned out as a self-preservation thing before I killed someone. She starts, what is she spewing? What monologue does she, does Rosemary ask her to tell her? It's the one, it's the 1741. She wants the story of the woman that, that uh, we're telling the in story Ireland. Of, 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 of Nora Corrigan? Yes, that's her name. And so like, she launches into a monologue with the entire family in like tableau behind her, with the camera alternately sweeping across her family in a panoramic view of their saddened faces watching her emote, emote a monologue like it was written by Shakespeare instead of Gary fucking David Goldberg, a Jew from New York. I'll tell you what, Gary David Goldberg went to see like a night of Cheever plays at, at Cal State, Cal State Fullerton or something back in 1972. 
Like he saw, he saw uh, like one production of an Albi play. He saw like three tall women once. <laughs> and so now for the rest of his life, he just, anytime he made something artsy, it had to be as theatrical as possible. Damned oh. be the consequences of the, of, of the genre you're actually working in. Oh, dear God. This went on. It had to have gone on for five minutes, for five solid minutes. I didn't time it. Boy, it was bad. I was looking at the bar at the bottom of the screen, and when they enter the kitchen, uh, Rosemary and, and Elise, for the big final scene, they had mm. six and a half minutes to go. Mm, 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 mm. God, it just made me sick. And so she tells the story that they, that they interrupted at the end of the first act and gets to the point that she reveals that the, the, there was a soldier who was 10 years younger than Kerrigan, and he was like, I'll marry you. And then she goes, and then they took each other's arms and walked out into the night. And that was your, fa your grandfather, Devin. And I'm like, wait, so the guy that's like, marrying her through for convenience so that way he owns property because he's 23 years old and he's marrying this old widow so that way he can like get her land and stuff like oh what a lovely story to remember and get retold twice in one 22 minute episode of family also that also yeah also it totally derails your entire sitcom episode and we end with 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 on, on Aunt Rosemary thanking Elise for telling a beautiful, beautiful version of the immortal Nora Kerrigan story from 1747. There have to be better stories. Gary David Goldberg, I wonder if he, if he, if he mined anything from his own life in this, if there was some, you know, sad Alzheimer's thing that, boy, you know, it's funny. When Gary David Goldberg moved on to doing Brooklyn Bridge, which was basically a nostalgic sort of kind of treacly story, he did it really well. Interesting. I thought it was not heavy-handed. You know, I thought the performances were very gentle. Now, of course, it's not a multi-camera show like this. It's a single-camera show, and it was done in a sort of a very nostalgic memory kind of thing, and I enjoyed it very much. But it, he, when he handles the same subject matter of nostalgic stories in, in this show, it's really ham-handed. It's just awful. Yeah, this, this Family Ties can do one kind of episode well. And that's usually young kids in love and all the funny characters around the young lovers. Mm -hmm. And every time they do that kind of episode, we love it. It's great. It works pretty well. Absolutely. But beyond that, this, this show is just not good at tackling the issues that it wants to tackle. Yep. Every limitation. I, it's just like, yeah, it fails at everything. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sad. But Bravo, Barbara Barry. Best performance we've seen on the show. So good. I Honestly, I would watch an entire show about her. Instantly in the Hall of Fame with uh, Talia Balsam and... and, uh, and uh, Tracy Pollan. Tracy Pollan, Gina Davis, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Absolutely. She's Easily better than go. all of them. She's better than all of yeah. them. Best performance we've seen. Hands down. I, I recommend people watching this episode just to see her uh, in this episode. Uh, you know, even Wikipedia mentions her performance in this episode. Really? That's amazing. For her to do a single episode of a show and get shouted out for it, I think it says something about it. It is a shout out. It really is. She's terrific. Yeah. I don't think in those days they had a guest star Emmy Award, but if, if she did it now, she'd be nominated for a guest star Emmy Award. I totally agree. Just right. terrific. Um, so, yeah, hopefully... This next episode coming up, we will have Scott with us. We're trying to plan out some scheduling, so be prepared for Scott Jones to join us. Exactly, and the hijinks will ensue. <laughs> Rate and review our show on iTunes. For questions and comments, email us at qualitytimewithfamilyties at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at QTWFT for updates. Uh, you can follow each of us. I'm at Paul Packler. I'm at Corpep, and Scott's at Follow Jones. 
And you can like our page on Facebook. We'd like to thank our host and producer, Barbara Dillon at Fanbase Press. Fanbase Press is a comic book publisher and an online community supporting other creators and fans through daily reviews, interviews, and podcasts that span the pop culture spectrum, fanbasepress.com. Also, we'd like to thank Perry Adams, who beautifully performs Family Ties and our theme song, Without Us. Check out Perry's website, perryadams.com. We'd like to thank Bryant Dillon, who created our fantastic drawing and artwork as well as edits our show. Bryant is the president and co-founder of Fanbase Press. Follow him on Twitter at Comic Book Slayer. And finally, we'd like to thank Sean Foster, Fanbase Press's graphic designer, for designing our logo. Uh, gang, we'll see you next week. Sha-la-la-la. Bye. <laughs>